Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 788, the real 788. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today's February 10th, 2023. Okay, welcome to another program of Anglican Unscripted. We're glad you could be here to watch us or listen to us on podcast format. We appreciate that very much because both George and I know Anglican Unscripted is not about us. It's about the audience. It's about uh, being able to sit down and find our webcams twice a week, find the good articles you guys want to hear about it, talk about it, and uh, hopefully be uplifting and encouraging about what's going on in the world. And we want this episode to sound just as encouraging as all the last, despite some of the news we're going to report. George, how are you doing this week? I'm dealing with a crisis, Kevin. My oh. daughter is trying to get her cats neutered. And Laura lives in San Francisco, and she has discovered the problem of socialist government. She <laughs> has she adopted two street cats who were kittens. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. And San Francisco has these public service announcements, spay and neuter your cat, you know, bring them to the SPCA, yeah. and uh, you can get it done for this and that. Well, it turns out that you have to be homeless to get your cats neutered or spayed for free. And it's going to cost her $500 a cat to have them neutered. That's too And so her crisis, is, <laughs> the, her crisis is, you know, it's cheaper for me to fly home with the two cats and have it done in Florida yeah. than it is to walk down the street to the SBCA. So Susan, my wife, has been on the phone calling around, seeing if we can get it below at least below a thousand at least for two cats to be neutered <laughs> well george but you know I, kevin at the end of the day daddy's gonna pay for it yeah, that's uh, right. this eats into hair care and taco budgets no i spent my summers on grandpa's farm and uh we had no trouble taking care of all the animals who needed to be neutered uh with a pliers and a, and a razor blade and that's how grandpa did it no pay meds no 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 general anesthesia so uh, I hope those cats uh, do well, George. They certainly are being cared for very well. All right, let's move on to some news. Uh, back in the past, we tried for a season to open the show with good news. And if any show needs to open with good news, it's this week's show. And I see that we have an uh, article we posted on an Anglican.inc saying that uh, Archbishop Ben Kwashi is going to retire. And that's good news-ish. He also says he's going to continue in his role in GAFCON and devote more time to that, George. He's just marked his 31st year of Episcopal Mm -hmm. consecration ordination, and he's announced that he's going to step down from diocesan office. And in his retirement, he's going to look after his rather large family of foster and adopted children and focus on the work of GAFCON, of which he serves as general secretary. He's had some problems with cancer, but it appears that it's been uh, in remission, and he hopefully has beaten it. So we pray that uh, this next phase of his ministry be as exciting and as encouraging as the previous three decades have been for him as bishop. Amen. Now, this is going to be a a time where I I don't, you know, GAFCON has kind of been out of the news, at least for the last two and a half years. We we both went to the... uh, Gafka and three in Jerusalem, and there's a, a certain good vibe going on there, and a lot of questions about how we're gonna how we're gonna retake the shores of uh, Britain, and ever since then, it's just whether they don't have money or time or resources, uh, the news level coming out of out of Gafka and leadership has has been dwindling. So, this this may give us an opportunity to see more from uh, Gafka. Let's move on to some further news. I have also listed here. Um, good news, bad news story, depending on how you look at it. Uh, General Theological Seminary, which is located in Manhattan, has sent out a press release saying that they are trying to reorganize to a point where they can be more profitable in five years. And to do that, we need to, to fire half the staff and we need to go to remote only learning and we need to maybe rent out our office space or something for other activities, George. And I give you the long, the long haul here. This is one of the first seminaries in uh, the Episcopal Church. It's the you know it's eighteen twenty three, 
that's a long time ago. Mm -hmm. um, and it has served well. And I know many mighty believers, uh, priests, and bishops who came out of there. Yes. Uh, General Seminary has two problems. Uh, one, the Episcopal brand has not been as uh, uh, productive, a powerful sales as it's been in the past. It's and ruined. two, Manhattan. Yeah. Um, General Seminary is uh, has only a small number of students, and it was built in the 1820s and subsequent new buildings added in a day when seminarians were single men straight out of college who could live in rather spartan quarters mm -hmm. uh, and be educated and then sent out into the world. Last two generations, uh, students at General Seminary moved there with their families or with their wife or partner in some cases and try to live in Manhattan and go to school because they can't live in a dorm type situation and it's not working. So if you have children, it's next to impossible unless you already live in Manhattan to attend General Seminary. So that drives students away to other places, uh, Yale Divinity School or uh, uh, Virginia Seminary, which has more land, more space, more money to help with those sorts of things. And then it had an internal fight uh, between its dean and the faculty, which left the faculty. He fired everybody, and they had to start over again. And it just started a spiral of, of, of losses. So last year, they basically sold themselves to Virginia Theological Seminary. They were amalgamated with Virginia. And Virginia's dean announced on Monday that they were letting go half the faculty they were no longer going to have residential students. Those faculty had lived at the college were being asked to move out. And the education would be distance learning from the seminary and the buildings would be repurposed to take advantage of their Manhattan location, which is very valuable real estate. Um, Chelsea had been residential, then it became commercial factory yeah. district. Now it's mm -hmm. becoming fashionable again mm -hmm. and they can and they're, they were losing $2 million a year. And that's unsustainable on any level due to deferred maintenance, the cost of faculty, the cost of this and that. Now they forecast that they will be profitable again within five years. And well, that's $10 million. That's, that's $10 million away. You know, well, I don't know if their losses will continue at that same yeah. level, but, mm -hmm. they, but they do seem to be able to turn around. And this is an asset worth several hundred million dollars i don't know sure that i'd say that yeah that if man if managed properly uh will be a money earner and help pay for the education of students in the future see seminary education is, is changing um when i was in seminary i was married i didn't have children at that point and i not only a handful of people were married um most people were still single at that time in the 30 years since then, and I, I in my late 20s, was one of the older students. Now, um, if I were in seminary in my late 20s, I'd be one of the youngest students. Oh, I believe yeah. the average age of ordination now is in the mid 50s uh, in the Episcopal Church because people do second careers. They work, uh, in industry, business, whatever it is, and then after their 30 year put in, they retire and enter the church. Uh, as a ministry, and that's happening around the world, the Western world, at any rate. So the model of training priests has to change, and that nobody has two million dollars to throw away on an old-fashioned way of doing things. Nope. Well, let's see what the next story is. Ah, still an okay story. <laughs> the Anglican Consultative Council is going to meet in Ghana next week, and. Uh, I think they have a big topic to talk about, George. Well, they've got a full and busy agenda. It's all been laid out. Usual stuff, uh, mosquito nets and five marks of mission and uh, ten lords a leaping, nine ladies, land, <laughs> uh, nine ladies dancing, you know, uh -huh. that sort of stuff. But they are going to talk about the conflicts between the Anglican world over human sexuality. Justin Welby is flying down to Accra, Ghana be participating and he will basically be on the hot seat to explain his words to General Synod that he fully expects the uh, the actions taken by General Synod to bless same-sex couples will 
what were his exact words? Let me see if I can find it without. Oh, which will, uh, well, it will involve people being murdered, women raped, children yeah. left homeless, mm -hmm. because the Anglicans in the developing world in Muslim majority countries will be the mercy of jihadists who will take out their anger at their Christian neighbor for what the Church of England has done. So that whole unity thing he was talking about last week was kind of a lie? Wow. Well, see, the thing is, poor jo well, we're, we're getting to the end of our day by <laughs> discussing general synods. So but let's maybe save that because part of the thing is the, if you look at Justin Welby, the pictures of him, he's not a happy or well man. I mean, this has taken its toll on him. Sure. I mean, look at the picture of Jimmy Carter day one and Jimmy Carter, you know, at the end of his term. And that's exactly what you're seeing with the, with the Archbishop Justin Welby. All right, we're going to move on to our next story. And I want to just set it up, you know, because people wonder uh, what Anglicans believe and what Anglicans can do. And a long time ago, we kind of outlined this in the uh, 39 articles. I'm going to bring up an important article that kind of addresses this. And I'm going to read it to you. And uh, then we'll go from there. Article 20 of the Authority of the Church. The Church hath power to decree rites or ceremonies and authority in controversies of faith. And yet it is not lawful for the Church to ordain anything that is contrary to God's written word or word written. Neither may it be so expounded one place of Scripture that it is repugnant to another. And there's there's more and more and more but um you know we kind of have rules here george that govern anglicanism as a thought as a principle as as what can we agree on and so when we're watching what's happening first in the episcopal church and the canadian church uh and in other provinces around the world and now the mother church you know we gotta say how did we get here you know, how did we arrive to the point where the Mother Church, where we have all begged for delegated Episcopal oversight, we've all assumed that there could be some salvation or, or repentance or a way forward offered by the Archbishop of Canterbury, how did we get to the point now that uh, the Church of England is going to offer blessings on same-sex marriages and civil unions? And let's talk about what happened first, George culmination of a six-year project, Living in Love and Faith, was a series of conversations around the Church of England on the issue of homosexuality, gay marriage, and blessings. From the beginning, uh, it was promised that this will not change anything. It will just basically give us the pulse of where things are. The reports presented to the bishops, and the bishops then proposed changing things. They came up with a rather legalistic uh, argument that we will have gay blessings but not change holy matrimony because we'll just bless the people not the institution of which they are entering a civil partnership this uh, was considered abhorrent and is abhorrent by conservatives traditionalists but the bishops said this is what we're going to do they did not show their theological work in coming to this conclusion they did not show any scriptural support for this. This was a purely political decision to try to keep gay activists on board and the church traditionalists with on the with the church traditionalists. And I think so it was also I think it was also an attempt to keep the state happy as well. You know, the, perhaps, the state, yeah, the state perhaps. wanted wanted full inclusion with uh, same sex marriage and blessings. Um, to be something that could be conducted inside a Church of England. So, Well, Parliament already said you didn't have to, and there's some MPs who want to undo that and say you have to. Mm -hmm. Well, well it, the, the failure of the Church of England in this level is lined. It's the same thing that has happened in America and Canada and other places. And, well, let's just sort of focus on what happened here. Um, so we come into General Synod, which... Uh, began this week, and it's concluded, uh, what concludes one o'clock on Friday, uh, today, English time. And on Tuesday, they began the debate on the m resolution from the bishops on living in love and faith. The night before, the evangelicals, as did the liberals and other groups, had their 
sort of private meetings where they get together to foment strategy. The liberals uh, have uh, had resolute had amendments put forward by Jan, Jane Ozan, who were pushing to take this even further, to have gay marriage, church marriage, not stop at the halfway house of blessing the union, because they felt and still feel that this is a an insulting step because it's still not what they want. And they came forward with a very much stronger uh, amendments. Conservatives wanted to gut this thing. And a lay member of Senate named Sam Margrave from the Diocese of Leicester, I'm sorry, excuse me, Diocese of Coventry, oh, yeah. mm -hmm. put forward amendments that would, in essence, restate the church's traditional teaching. In the evangelical breakout group, they divided between those who said, we cannot allow this to go forward because it will depart from scripture, depart from the traditions of the church. And the others, the majority in the room said, yes, we agree with you, but this is not the day we're going to die in battle. We want to take the battle forward. And so if we focus on the fudge factor, which is this is not a change that that we're not doing anything that sex is still between a man and woman in holy matrimony but George, we I can live we can live and fight another day you can use the word deceive you don't have to say fudge i mean they're deceiving the the church of england and its uh, lay persons and and britain by saying you can have it both ways well I'm just repeating what the arguments were. I'm not passing judgment. Uh, I'm just saying that judgment. there was <laughs> the, the, this is what and and so there was a real dis, dis and such that some conservative bishops would not support Sam Margrave's amendments. So the debate begins. Margrave's amendments come up, and he's attacked personally as being a homophobe and a bigot and this and that. And his arguments are well put, and he had some support from other lay members of Synod. Uh, ben John, who was the son of Canon J. John, who was the famed ev uh, evangelist. Luke Appleton, uh, basically friends of this show, who we've been <laughs> in communication with, sure. and others, yeah. who basically restate, you know, we should not seek to please men, but we should seek to please God. Mm -hmm. And then we had people like Martin Snow, who's the Bishop of Leicester. Martin is one of the sign signatories to the statement from conservative bishops last week, what the doctrine of marriage was. And he said, I support what Sam Margrave is saying, but I'm not gonna back this because of who's saying it, because Sam's tone is too confrontational. And we need to basically walk together, not to atomize ourselves. I think that was a mistake Yes. My opinion, Martin Snow, I think it was a mistake of basically dividing forces, but there you have it. But Sam Margrave's amendments failed, such that only one bishop voted in favor of the Margrave amendments. The bishops either abstained or voted against it. We don't know the souls of each person, but probably half of them voted because it was Sam who put it forward, because Sam is making a stink, and that's you know, we need to be able to fix this behind closed doors and not let people see how we do things. And you know, but it, here's the truth to that. They spent weeks trying to make Sam Margave the enemy. Mm -hmm. and, you know, it's this didn't all of a sudden happen. They saw that he's oh. articulate. He, he knows what he's talking about. He can back it up with reason, scripture, and tradition. We need to make him the enemy. We need to, we need, we need to make him the phobe. Even the Bishop of Coventry, his own bishop, Christopher Coxworth, who is and he is counted among the evangelicals and the conservatives, reported him to police for hate crimes of uh, tweeting about the uh, emperor has no clothes. Of, uh, and, oh, by the way, the police investigated this and found there was no case to answer. There's no hate crime involved in Sam's tweets. But so Sam's efforts were defeated. But the fight, he all, he put forward a good fight. And it's all recorded, and people will have that for prosperity. And poor Martin Snow, I think, is forever going to be tagged mm. for his words. Um, yeah. There you go. In fact, he even had to be admonished 
by the uh, by the uh, chair of the uh, debate saying you can't you know uh, if you're going to talk about somebody uh, you have to let them know in advance you just can't stop get up and start talking about why such and such is an sob uh you have to give him a chance to be prepared to answer with his birth certificate showing he's not an <laughs> sob uh but so jane ozen's uh amendment came up and they pushed hard and no new arguments for same-sex marriage were put forward that we hadn't heard already uh and these arguments are not scriptural they're not theological they're purely emotional and pastoral how i feel the need to make people feel better to make them feel welcome to make them feel loved mm -hmm. and one oh. uh, uh, a woman priest from oxford clergy diet uh, delegate said that you know i can't explain why we should do this I don't have a good reason. We just need to do it. Ouch. That was her argument. Yeah, I mean, and you, you and I have discussed this before. How does a church show itself as accepting and not affirming? You know, and this is a question that came up before the Church of England. And they decided, you know, it's better to deceive you today than die tomorrow. We, we can push this down the road by going half measure. And, you know, sorry, Jane Ozan, sorry, uh, pro LGBTQ people, but this is the best we can do. It's going to be a two step. Now, you know, we'll talk more about this in a, in a second, but what happens at the next drone instead? Is, is that step two? You know? Well, there were other speakers. Uh, uh, a woman who is a, a, of African descent, uh, who is a member of the uh, Holy Trinity Brompton, the Alpha Church. Mm -hmm. She's a member of their parochial uh, church council saying you can't do this. This is just abhorrent to the wider Anglican communion. You had a, 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 a barrister. Uh, a, a, I think he was even a king's council, which is a, the mark of professional achievement in the legal world. Um, get up and give a, an articulate theological reason why this will not fly. And Sami Shahada, the Archbishop of uh, Alexandria. Yeah. Uh, in Egypt uh, was an invited guest. He uh, said, "Please do not do this. This will dethrone. This will remove the Church of England from its place as a mother church of the Anglican Communion. Seventy-five percent of the Anglican world will turn its back on you for your abandoning Scripture and the doctrines of the Church." There was a Coptic Orthodox guest who was an as bishop. Uh, I don't remember his name. And he essentially said the same thing. This is contrary to the received tradition of the Christian world. We may differ on certain local customs, but we acknowledge you as Christians and you acknowledge us as Christians. We do not see this as a Christian act. Uh, very strong statements. And, and from people who almost always are friendly. It's not like the Russian Orthodox got up and got to <laughs> say what skunks no. the English are. <laughs> Nobody would have been so... The fair warning, and even Justin Welby got up and with tears uh, in his eyes, and I don't know his heart, I don't know if he's an actor or if he actually felt this, but he looked miserable, he's lost weight, he's aged, he just looks awful, physically awful, said that, you know, women will die, uh, women will be raped, people right. will die, mm -hmm. all of these things will happen because of what we do here today, we need to keep that in mind because the jihadists will come after Christians and not distinguishing between uh, a liberal English vicar uh, from the north of London and a villager in uh, rural Nigeria. They'll kill him so that you can have what you want. Well, I, but then I, well be said, but nonetheless, but nonetheless, we should do it. So, and the part of his anguish is that he knows that he is. I, well, he has to know that well, the voice of the Church of England has is now muted as far as international affairs. And the voice of the Archbishop of Canterbury is no longer first among equals. That so he is certainly going to be not last. I can think of three more before that. But he, you know, he's, he's lost that... Uh, driving power that the Church of England and the Archbishop of Canterbury have had for hundreds of years. But I need to introduce something else here. He's worried about 
international persecution of Christians because of this act. I want to talk about the Christians who live inside of Britain who are going to be persecuted by the priest, they were persecuted by their bishops, they'll be persecuted by the secular uh, 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 citizenship, they'll be persecuted for the press, because they believe in Christian values and they know that uh, a same-sex relationship or same-sex marriage cannot be holy, cannot be part of church life. And to think that is now a thought crime. And the Church of England will not support you or defend you. And we've seen that this week, this month, this year already, where bishops have put people under the bus for having traditional beliefs in marriage, George. Oh, yes, we've reported extensively about a, uh, a priest who was a chaplain at a Church of England boarding school who essentially was fired for not uh, joining the woke bandwagon, but stating the traditional doctrine of the church on human sexuality. And the bishops, his personal bishop, Libby Lane, basically you know, let him, left him out to hang dry. Institutional chaplains, school chaplains, prison chaplains, people working in the National Health Service will now be subject to being compelled to do things against their conscience because the doctor of the Church of England has changed. And if they won't do it, that's not going to cut any ice with their secular masters. Now, I, I agree with you, Kevin. This, this is not going to result in the death of people in England the way it will in uh, Pakistan or Nigeria or the Sudan but it's uh, going to drive the Christian voice even further from the public square. We just had another uh, a Roman Catholic priest was just arrested for praying outside an abortion clinic, I believe in Birmingham, England. Uh, not, um, not a Church of England? Not an Anglican priest or bishop? No, no, Roman Catholic priest. Uh, silent prayer. He was stopped by a uh, police officer and said, what are you praying? And... Uh, and when the priest was told, he was arrested for uh, violating the ordinances against praying around abortion clinics. Well, you, you did mention one thing, Kevin, that I want, want to follow up on briefly, that uh, Justin Welby will drop several rankings in the Anglican world, but he will always be a little bit higher than Stephen Cottrell or Cottrell. Oh, no, I saw that. Oh, it was so bad. Because <laughs> Cottrell, well... This is unkind of me, but he really came off as a bit of a bumptious idiot. He was asked by Ben John the question, if a bishop doesn't believe anymore, should he resign in the doctrines of the Church of England? And Cottrell said no. And essentially began went off on this tangent that God is doing a new thing with gay marriage. And just like the doctrine of the Trinity had to be developed over time, so the doctrine of gay marriage has to be developed over time. This is a journey that we're on. And then he threw in John Henry Newman's point about the development of Christian doctrine, which Cottrell completely mangled. He got it completely wrong. It's not a writ to whatever floats your boat, man. That's the latest <laughs> doctrine that? because you think it's swell. <laughs> so, and... I should also point out that it's bad form to, to to go to Newman, who left the Church of England to become a Catholic. Uh, is Cottrell going to leave the Church of England to become a Unitarian, or were the Unitarians not going to be the Church of England? But but he was rather rude and condescending to the questioner, Ben John. And later, uh, John said that Cottrell took him aside and apologized for his uh, rather rude and presumptuous behavior. But this is, this is form for Cottrell. Cottrell's the one when he was Bishop of Chelmsford set, told conservative clergy to get out if you don't like yeah, where he's going. Don't like it? Go. He's, he's not a theologian. He, he's a uh, glad hander. He's a politician. And he's also rather smug. Now, that's a, unkind of me. I shouldn't say yeah, that. But I, yeah, he we don't appeared, need to do that. In, that. in that exchange, he appeared smug and not as a father in God, but as a he later went on to the BBC. He, they asked him a question, and he spent four minutes waffling, using some using a combination of church and corporate ja, uh, jargon to basically avoid answering questions. So he's missed his calling in politics. He'd be a perfect uh, MP. <laughs> uh, the church is politics, but, sadly. Well, I want to get to the point that uh, you know we are now to the 
a place where we are debating a theological point whether or not uh, praying for the blessing of a same-sex marriage and a same-sex civil union, how is that not solemnizing the marriage? Yeah, how does that draw short? He, he, well, because Andrew Corns, a from a Chichester, a lay delegate, put forward a resolution that restated the obvious. Corns is of a conservative bent. And this is uh, sort of the emblematic of the anti-Margrave wing within the evangelical group. Corns' amendment, numbers 67 and 68, at the very end of the day, uh, I'll read them because it's important to hear what, th because this is the only amendment that was accepted by Synod. It endorses the decision of the College and House of Bishops not to propose any change to the doctrine of marriage and that their intention that the final version of the prayers of love and faith should not be contrary to or indicative of a departure from the doctrine of the Church of England. And then the second calls upon the House of Bishops when further refining prayers of love and faith to include instructions making it clear that they should not be used so as to indicate or imply affirmation of sexually active relationships outside of holy matrimony or to invoke God's blessing on such relationships. This is a new, this was passed. And what this says is just as we said in the past that clergy may be in civil partnerships so long as they're chaste, the Church of England is going to bless same sex unions with the understanding that they're going to be chaste. This is a whole new level of deceit. Okay, I remember the, oh, you guys can live together uh, if you're attracted to each other, if you don't sleep together. But George, this is, this is satanic deceit. This is, this is a whole new level. And it was, it was passed by Senate. Yes, and, but let's, let's put ourselves in the conservatives' position. They, need, they believe they needed to claw out something that allowed them to continue within the Church of England. The Margrave approach would create an either or then this the corns approach would create a yes but and the, because of the maybe it's english culture the with structure of the church the sort of people who become bishops they're more willing for a yes but approach and that's what passed and then the final vote with the corns amendment which basically says that this blessings shall not imply that the church is affirming sexually active relationships out of holy matrimony, which is male-female, which, you know, Ozan and company had a fit over this one, but they lost. This passed, 36 in favor in the bishops, four against, two abstaining. So the bishops basically led the show. They were happy for the fudge. While the clergy were almost split, 111 to 85, and the lay people, 103 to 92, both in favor. So what this tells us is that to change the doctrine, it needs two thirds. And this synod membership is going to be the same for the next three years. So there's not a vote there to change it, far from it. And I don't see it happening within the next 10, 15 years, uh, but things can change. Yeah, the, but the bishops, <laughs> the bishops voted for. I would say fudge. You call it deceit. Um, they voted for a fiction, a legal fiction, that allows them to have it both ways. Okay, so bringing back recent history in the 1970s and 1980s, General Convention of the Episcopal Church did many things like this, even the 90s, and. Uh, we're to the point now they're changing prayer books and they, you know they, they got that spark rolling they made sure uh what was a sin isn't a sin they redefined that now they redefined marriage and now you're to the point where there is no safe bishop who uh, can agree with traditional marriage in the episcopal church it's an overstatement but uh, that's the trajectory it's going. Not that's the trajectory the trajectory <laughs> Yes. You know, so um, how do well, like, they not, like, how do the they go the this latest, far and not stop? Well, 
the good news is is that the, they can look at the Episcopal Church and see that they've got 20 plus years to figure out how to how to put a stop to it. Because the latest with the Episcopal Church is the press by the liberals to change the prayer book. The bishops don't want to do that. They want to create a virtual prayer book so yeah. that there are gay prayers in the cloud that you can download, but the book in the pew won't have them. So that for people like George, who if he had to buy a new prayer book that had it in it, that would be a you know, pray, praying shapes believing. It's one of the modern Anglican tenets. And Excellent. if we've got a prayer book that teaches false, if I have a prayer book in the written page that teaches a false teaching, that's a line. Um, if I have a, a convention that says people in Manhattan can do this, but you know, you in Florida do what you want, that's them, we're us, they're wrong, they're hellbound. You know, I'm being silly, but you, you see what I'm saying. No, it it's, allows it's Lex distinction. Orde, Lex Creed, Crende. I Lex, mean. Lex Orde, Lex Credende. Yeah. So what the bishops are saying is that they're still holding on to that understanding of how Anglican polity is done. Um, but here's the thing, the Episcopal Church, even in its current form, is more prayer book faithful than the Church of England, because the Church of England has so many alternative service books and so many things that, and the evangelicals in the Church of England hardly ever use the, the regular prayer book. In other words, yeah. so it, it's for our American audience, you need to understand that evangelicals are not, I'm an evangelical in the, in the American church, evangelicals in the Church of England would look at me as a pseudo-Catholic. And, and that's true. I use that's, a prayer book. I wear a collar. <laughs> I, you know, uh, on one of my visits to London, I uh, ACNA bishop and I, it wasn't ACNA then; it was ACN then. Uh, visited a prominent downtown London Anglican church. I'm not going to name it, but inside there was no prayer book. There was no uh, pamphlet or there's a couple of bulletins. But when you sat in the pew, you saw a Roman Catholic missal. Hmm. Hmm. Well, I think I walked in the wrong church. <laughs> Bishop, what's this? Oh, you don't know? They don't follow. They don't. They're not a prayer book society like we are in America. And uh, you know, it's just it's just not the same. I said, Oh my lord! Everything I know about Anglicanism is from the prayer book, George. Yeah. And well, I, we can overplay this and overstate this, but. <laughs> The, the, the categories that hold in the United States are not transferable to the United Kingdom. Yeah. For instance, Ford and Faith in the United States is conservative. Ford and Faith in the UK is not. Um, but so we had the final vote. And there were, as I mentioned, there were some unseemly things afterwards uh, where in the tea room, Justin Welby, which is sort of the break room outside of the floor, uh, they then followed, went on to the very important talk topic of safeguarding, which the Church, of, which is a whole other show or series of shows, which the Church of England has failed miserably at. Well, everybody left to go into the tea room, and Justin Welby gave a bouquet of flowers to the Bishop of London, and everybody was all teary and joyous and this and that. And then, before the end of the day, the Daily Telegraph had a story uh, that. The Anglican Communion, as a as a whole, as a group, is rejecting what you've all done today. Mm -hmm. And now there's the second part of our show, which are the responses. Yes. To what took place. <laughs> okay. Well, yeah, why don't we have fun here? What's our response, George? Yeah, you're in the Episcopal oh, you poor Church. Guys. Yeah, I know. I mean, you're an Episcopal priest. You have a safe bishop, and uh, maybe a safe bishop to come. Um, but is this something that is going to grow? The Church of England, or what is the cause of effect here, uh, especially historically? Historically, what is the what's the cause here? Well, you've asked me five questions. Um, <laughs> One question. Historically, what's what's what, this going to do? What would I what would I do personally? And not having a parish, so I don't have the same sense of where my congregation would be. But I would stay. I would pray, but I would not pay. Yeah. In other words, I, I'm not going to give up my heritage. Uh, I'm not going to give up my traditions, uh, the people's traditions, the people's buildings, because a group of nut jobs 
who are dressed in purple have decided to go crazy. Uh, I'm con going to continue to be faithful, continue to worship the Lord as we've always done so, but I'm not going to fund it uh, if, if I don't have to, and I won't. So those we have uh, the phenomena of uh, good stewards' trusts in a number of dioceses already in England. Uh, Southwark, for example, I think is the biggest one. Mm -hmm. uh, pray, and we'll pray for the bishops. Pray to the Lord that he intervene. Because at the end of the day, it's not how much work I do. It is the work of the Spirit moving amongst us. I can, you know, throw myself in something. I can do nothing. And at the end of the day, it's where the Spirit takes us. But, you know, I, but that is me. And that is the approach I've taken in the Episcopal world. This will cause some people, you will, if you are a traditionalist member of the church, you will lose some people who say, today is the day that I stopped going to the Church of England because of what they've done in Synod. And their response is a faithful one, a true one, but it's their response. And you will lose some people. Um, how do you go forward? You go forward as you always do, worshiping the Lord and not taking any notice of what the world wants of you, but to do what the Lord seeks for you to do, which mm -hmm. is to honor him in all things. Yeah. In my case, uh, I'm as loud as I can be to either uh, help change inside the church or be led to the door like last time. So, you know, we all, we all have different uh, uh, ways to respond to this, but uh, the most proficient and efficient way to do this is to uh, come at it with prayer and fasting. You know, mm -hmm. the people you had trusted are not trustable anymore. You need to seek God's face in this and you need to uh, seek the Holy Spirit in this to help convict yourself and help convict uh, the archbishops, bishops, and clergy in this who, and laity who, have, are, who are leading the Britons astray. You know, the, the, well, in, yeah. the, th the, thing, the thing to keep in mind, Kevin, is I come from a particular stream of Episcopal. I'm from Philadelphia, and that experience sort of formed yeah. Episcopal Church the old Episcopal Church before the the, the Jeffrey Shorey era of uh, people, you know, taking it astray. There were a number of different Episcopal churches based upon geography and traditions. The Episcopal Church in Philadelphia was heavily influenced by the Quaker tradition, so that there's a there's a very strong spiritual element to it that is say absent from a Boston Episcopal Church or New York Episcopal Church. Mm -hmm. Basically, because you sort of interact more with your neighbors than you do with your fellow Episcopalians from a, from the colonial times. And second, we've been Episcopalians for 200 years and no bishop has ever come to the church. So we just got on just fine <laughs> until 1796, it was when the first Episcopal bishop, you know, we've been here for almost just fine. 175 yeah. years. And we had, we were doing fine. Thank you as Episcopalians uh, with the bishop in London. He can stay in London. We're here. He's got nothing to do with us, except that he'll ordain our bit priest who will come over and never see the guy again and write him a letter every year telling how we're doing. Um, with a little money I, attached. Yes. Little money, but the, but the sense is that, you know, God is more important than the bishop. God is, you know, these structures are set to sort of organize things, but they're not the be all and end all. So that form of Episcopal worldview, if you will, can survive these sorts of things because at the end of the day, if bishop, you know, I'm happy. My, I've been here at this church. This will be coming on 10 years soon. Next year will be 10 years. He's been here three times. That's plenty. That's enough. <laughs> you know, maybe, maybe, maybe one or more. You know, that's plenty. We get no money. We get no literature. I mean, we don't do. And we're not involved. You know, we just are. Episcopal. Oh, you're semi congregationalists. Well, that's the Episcopal mm. way in the yeah, United States for going on four hundred years. Yeah. Well, what's new? Now in Africa, it's very different, and in England, it's very different. So it's hard to transpose these things. All right. So the vote was so taken. We'll move to, all move to Florida and yeah. we'll do it right. We'll do it. So the, the vote was taken. Uh, the uh, LLF passed. 
and now we are getting responses from around the world. I got a response from Bishop Lyons, the Evangelicals, Sydney, the Global South, GAFCON, and many, many more. Um, let's just go through them uh, a little bit. We don't have to. Everybody knows well, what they're going to say. Let's work, you know. Yeah, let's work inside out. Like EFAC, the Evangelical Fellowship of the Anglican Communion, led by mm -hmm. Henry Scriven as its secretary. Uh, this is a departure from the faith. Kanishka Raphael, the Bishop of Sydney, they've rejected scripture. The Church of England Evangelical Council, this is a lose-lose situation. Uh, Andy Lyons, the door is open. Do you see that this is why we're doing what we're doing? Mm -hmm. The come to the Anglican network in uh, Europe. Uh, Stephen uh, Kazimba, the Archbishop of Uganda, press conference today we're out of fellowship with the church of england they have departed from the christian faith as we as we know it um and then the big ones the sort of the groups the pan anglican groups first out of the box was the global south fellowship of anglicans they cond condemned what was said they're out of fellowship with the church of england and on monday 12 primates who are affiliated with the global south fellowship of england should gather i believe it has to be by zoom because zoom, i don't think probably. they can get all together yeah. that quickly they're going to gather and sort of lay out a strategy, but their announced intent is to dethrone the Archbishop of Canterbury as leader of the Anglican world. But what does that look like? That means sending a letter to the Pope and saying, when you talk to Justin Welby, realize you're just talking to the head of the Church of England. You're not talking to the, the other uh, 80, 78 yeah. million Anglicans. Mm -hmm. yeah, so just be warned, beware. So and interfaith relations will change. Um, we will need to rethink well, how we I, re react with uh, the money that you give us. Yeah, but do we turn it away, or we, or were we happy to take it, but realize that it, you don't get anything in return for it other than us. Well, more? internationally things change. I, we got a response from Franklin Graham. I didn't mention him, but yeah, Frank. Yeah, well, largely absent Frank, from response was saying, yeah. Go ahead. Well, Franklin Graham basically saying that the, this is not the act of a Christian denomination. Mm. You cannot, as you read uh, at the very beginning of our show, Article 20, you cannot propound one place of scripture, God is love, so that it is repugnant to another, which is flee from pornea and sin, and the uh, male and female, he created them. So, the the... the I was surprised how quickly the reactions came back. And Gafcon followed, essentially, Justin Welby did the impossible of reconciling Gafcon and the Global South, uh, <laughs> where he's, he put them on the same page for the first time in years. Well, no, um, now, the, does, does not Justin Welby, Welby in the Church of England become a common enemy, like Catherine Jeffrey Shorey was? Yes and no, because Catherine Jefford Shorey was a no-holds-barred supporter. Justin Welby can say this will kill people, and I know it. Catherine Jefford Shorey would never recognize she her. Admit that, yeah. Yeah. So you've got Justin Welby, who, will say, who has a history of saying different things to different audiences. So... It, he will say to a conservative audience the things the conservatives want to hear. He'll say to a liberal audience the things they want to hear. So Welby will go to the ACC in Ghana and speak of his great sorrow and just, we've got to find friends, a way to walk together through all of this. And some people who need his money or need his need what they think is the political weight of the Church of England to help them in their domestic life will go along. Uh, others will say, I'm sorry, you, you, this is a step too far. This is not going to be an immediate cataclysm. Kigali is now, the Kigali meeting of GAFCON is now going to be more important because it's basically going to be the first large gathering over a thousand people post, and there will be delegates from the Church of England. Yeah, so that too, if, but... the Church of England will no longer be the enemy, but some people within the Church of England will be the enemy. I think Gafcon needs to be sure that every Global South primate is there. You know, whatever it takes to uh, to get more hotel rooms, 
and bring them in and whatever entourage they want because now you have a chance to respond in a single voice to what just happened in the Church of England. I think that's important. But here's the, here's who's silent, George. Here's who I don't hear anything from, who, you know, maybe 20 years ago, or certainly when it was Pope Benedict, you would have heard some. I haven't heard uh, Pope Francis or the Roman Catholics even mention this anywhere. And I, I did a Google search this morning. Either I don't know how to use Google or they're being silent. Some Roman Catholics are being silent. The hierarchy. Google Gavin Ashenden, he's got plenty to say. <laughs> Google, there are a lot of, there are Catholics on one level mm -hmm. who have free to speak their minds and they speak them very clearly and plainly. And then there's the officialdom who probably think this is just wonderful because this is what the German Catholic bishops want to do. Um, I'm surprised we haven't seen some sort of congratulations from Germany on this move. But <sighs> hey, things move slowly. But the 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 uni I don't want to say universal because I've not read everything in super fine detail. But the universal response from the evangelical world is condemnation. The Anglo-Catholic world is silent, and the society was an absent player at this meeting. The Anglo-Catholics, for one reason or another, were neutered by their leadership in this Senate debate. Not all Anglo-Catholics, but the movement was of no, was of no consequence in these discussions. Mm -hmm. Some will say, well, you guys abandoned us 30 years ago on women, fair play, you know, what goes around comes around, we've now abandoned you on the gay issue. Mm, I hope it's not that way, but uh, I don't there know. you go. All right, well, let's finish up with what I call the timeline. Here in America, we went from a policy of don't ask, don't tell, then we allowed for civil unions, then we allowed for same-sex marriages, which was confirmed by the Supreme Court and then we moved into a transition period where we went into an inquisition for those who do not uh, believe in these new rights and, and equal marriage uh, for those who uh, have same-sex attraction. And the problem I have with this is it doesn't stop in the middle where there's an equal right. It always turns left where there's an inquisition. And you are persecuted if you do not believe uh, what the left wants you to believe. I'm going to see this and expect this within the Church of England because we saw this slowly developed with the women's orders. We saw that mutual flourishing was a satanic lie. They were, they were not going to flourish together. One has to replace the other. And I think, sadly, that same-sex marriage and same-sex civil unions will soon be affirmed and practiced within the Church of England, 10, 20, 30 years down the road, but that's the trajectory. We saw it with the Episcopal Church. I would not be surprised to see it with the Church of England. George, before we conclude, any uh, thoughts? Yes, I would uh, say that the Church of England does have a mechanism which the Episcopal Church and the Anglican Church of Canada do not have, and that's an independent judiciary. The next step for conservatives will be to file lawsuits in the ecclesiastical courts, pointing out the farcical nature of uh, gay blessings are not an, aff an affirmation of sexually act relationships outside of holy matrimony. And the courts in the church, which have independent judiciary, will rule on this and if they follow the law, if they follow the clear logic and the clear meaning of language, they will throw this out. And this will require a two-thirds vote of synod. And that's not going to happen uh, for the foreseeable future. So what does that mean? Do the liberals walk out? Uh, in other words, do they... W will, will a legal defeat force them to come to the table to negotiate? The Church of England Evangelical Council is asking for differentiation. Hmm. Is that a different province? Is that two yeah. churches of England? Is that, What does that look like? At this stage, the liberals are winning. They don't need to uh, make any concessions. 
when they lose the legal battle, they will basically be forced into a position of having lost everything they've just fought for. The bishops will be ashamed, shown to be basically buffoons. And at that point, will we have negotiation and a settlement? Uh, oh, you know, there were some Episcopal dioceses that weathered the, the Gene Robinson affair well and allowed people to leave with their property without any grief. Uh, Rio Grande, Central mm -hmm. Florida. Mm -hmm. uh, where liberal Yeah. In other words, uh, it was only when Catherine Jefford Shorty got involved and said, no, uh, I won't let you leave, that things fell apart. Catherine Jefford Shorty is no longer in the picture, and maybe wiser heads will prevail in the Church of England. Yeah. I think she got bad legal advice. But you mentioned Catherine Jefford Shorey. She also showed up in Tanzania after uh, what was happening here in America, and she was brought to task by the primates, and the primates made her cry. And uh, uh, she was very sad for it, but left Tanzania, and nothing changed. Uh, will the same effect happen to Justin Welby? What is this crying business? Stephen Cottrell was blubbering after the announcement of gay marriages. He was so happy. Justin Welby is crying at General Synod. You know, what is this? You know, this is friends. I thought the English was stiff up her lip and didn't display emotions, you know. Uh, what is this emotional emotionalism that's so overwhelmed Synod? What's yeah. going on here? I don't know. Well, let's end with a prayer. Father, forgive us for we do not know what we do. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger, and you've been watching episode 788 of Anglican Unscripted.